When it comes to making award-winning feature films or any installment in a major franchise, it should be no surprise that a whole lot of great scenes end up as sliced celluloid on the cutting room floor. Major spoilers ahead! Great films leave us with plenty of questions. Was Deckard a replicant? How did Luke take the death of his best friend? Is Natasha alive? Today, we've got the answers to all three of those questions, and a whole lot more. Just one of those things, you know. Ever since Natasha, aka Black Widow, aka the only Avenger with some actual sense, bit the dust in Endgame, well, hit the pavement really, but that's neither here nor there, fans have been clamoring to know whether there's any chance the beloved heroine is actually alive. Fans have been titulated by an interview with director Kate Shortland in which she hinted at including a reply whistle during the post credit scene with Yelena visiting Black Widow's grave, implying the Avenger might yet live. One of the most frustrating parts of the original Star Wars series is the fact that neither of Luke's Jedi mentors ever mentioned Luke's relationship to notorious Space General and Palpatinic Pawn Vader. Why? According to a deleted scene from Return of the Jedi, Yoda confessed to the silence being his call. Apparently, if Obi-Wan had lost his way, he would have informed Luke of his father's identity much earlier. Knowing that Yoda was the one to keep the secret helps OG Obi-Wan's character line up more with his characterization in the prequels. Characters in the Harry Potter universe love not saying the name of the series' main villain, but viewers of the movies are never let in on one major reason why. Apparently, saying the Dark Lord's name aloud has the unfortunate consequence of alerting every Death Eater to the location and the identity of the name dropper, and knowing that kinda makes all the fuss over he who must not be named make more sense. Originally, The Shining included a scene at the end wherein Jack's boss, Stuart Ullman, returns the writer's tennis ball to Danny in the hospital. Except in doing so, Ullman outs himself as being just one more entity tied to the ancient evil of the Overlook Hotel. How? By having the tennis ball, which was last seen at the Overlook, in his possession at all. Get Out offers up a heaping help of horrifying hypnosis alongside a cast of truly despicable villains. One enduring question from the movie, though, is just how complicit is Rose? A deleted scene explains that Rose has been the subject of the same hypnosis her mother uses to entrap and drain young black men. This likely confirms that the daughter of the evil family is more unwitting pawn than participatory monster, but there's no way to be sure. Despite the opening sequence of the original establishing the monumental donkey butt personality of David Carradine's Bill, a long sequence omitted from the second installment in the series really drove the point home. Starring the indomitable Michael Jai White as a rival apprentice of Pai Mei, a fight scene was filmed that included Beatrix Kiddo standing by while Bill puts the full brutality of his beliefs on display. The death of Saruman is reduced to a single sentence in The Return of the King, but that wasn't always the case. Originally, a scene showing Saruman's death and subsequent fall from the heights of Isengard was to be included. Unfortunately, the scene itself ends up being kinda gruesome and slapstick in a way that just doesn't work. Oh, and this death snub is the reason why Christopher Lee skipped the premiere. Okay, seriously, why was this scene of Luke mourning Han removed from The Last Jedi? Was it to make sure the movie had enough room for Finn and Rose to go to Vegas? Was there an alien in George Lucas's mind that firmly needed to be seen for merchandising reasons? It feels like Disney robbed the original Jedi hero of the chance to express his and the audience's grief at Han's death. On a lighter note, Titanic, yeah, see, bet you didn't see that transition coming, apparently had a version of the finale in which Rose is heckled by bystanders about how nuts her intent to cast away her fancy necklace is. This results in the wizened geriatric giving an unbearably preachy cheese fest of a speech condemning those around her for valuing trivial things like priceless jewels. Yeah, okay there, James Cameron. One of the best things about the original cut of Superman 2 is that it ended with the implication that the Man of Steel was like, super down with murder. Now, hear me out here, you got Krypton's favorite remaining son going full Leonidas on the film's three villains by kicking them down an icy crevasse to their probable deaths. This alternate version though has the villains alive and well, and taken into custody by the totally real Arctic police. Right, okay. 
A deleted scene from the Blade Runner confirmed all suspicions that Deckard is actually a replicant by depicting his dream of a unicorn. See, on its own that's nothing, but when taken together with a later scene where Gaff leaves an origami unicorn for Deckard to find, these scenes imply Gaff was able to view Deckard's dreams, something only possible if the latter is a machine. My favorite on this list charming and heartwarming animated film Lilo and Stitch chose not to include a scene wherein Stitch accidentally kills Lilo's pet goldfish and, as a result, watches in shame and horror as a devastated Lilo frantically buries her pet beside the grave of her parents. It's kind of clear why this scene didn't make the cut, but it would have been powerful to see more of Stitch's moral transformation as he learns from Lilo why it's important not to hurt other people's feelings, or kill goldfish or whatever. In the original Alien, there was a scene which never made the big screen release that revealed in detail how the alien life cycle worked. See, Ripley was supposed to discover two of her traveling companions in cocoons towards the end of the film, but it's lucky that this scene was cut given that it totally tramples over one of the series' most iconic points, the inclusion of the alien queen as the linchpin of the xenomorph life cycle in the sequel, Aliens. Speaking of Aliens, the 1986 sequel's theatrical release apparently made Sigourney Weaver apoplectic when she learned about the deletion of the scene which depicted Ripley's discovery and subsequent grief that her 11-year-old daughter had died at the age of 37 during the decades Ripley herself was in cryostasis. Weaver was understandably angry given that the scene itself sets the entire tone for the rest of Ripley's arc through the movie. Independence Day left many viewers with many questions like, when are the aliens coming? Is the White House alright? And why am I watching this movie? But one of the biggest was, how on earth did Jeff Goldblum ruin a hyper-advanced alien fleet with a virus he developed on a MacBook from the 90s? First of all, reasonable question. Second of all, a deleted scene has the answer. Goldblum's character spent time researching another alien craft, which was found at Roswell to reverse engineer his digital plague via the software already on the ship. Very clever, that Jeff Goldblum. Speaking of humanity, Will Smith's I Am Legend included a scene which showed Smith's character realizing the horrifying Dark Seekers actually had human-like empathy and emotion when a few of them rescued one of their kind that Smith had tortured earlier. The scene involved Smith apologizing and being spared, but this would have made the movie's ending, you know, where Smith is blown to smithereens, slightly less uh, triumphant if it were actually depicting a war crime. John Carpenter's The Thing famously ends with McCready and Childs sharing whiskey beside the burnt-out shell of the research station, unsure if The Thing is dead. The ambiguity is one of the movie's strong points, and Carpenter resisted calls from the studio to provide a clear ending. Except, oh yeah, there's a deleted scene from the ending, which shows a husky fleeing the rubble, pretty obviously implying that The Thing made it out. Womp womp womp. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 has a deleted scene where Peter Parker meets his dad and finds out that daddy faked his own death for… reasons. We've covered a lot of game-changing omissions in this video, but holy cow if this one doesn't take the cake. Imagine for a second, Spider-Man with living parents. It'd be kinda like Bruce Wayne with living parents. He probably wouldn't be a superhero anymore. Well that <clears throat> just happens to be exactly what I'm looking for. I'm. Uh... Telling stories well is an exhausting labor of love and no product is ever perfect. Every author, actor, director will tell you that more content makes the trash bin than ever ends up in the final cut, but at the same time, for fans, the chance to see what might have been is a joy in and of itself.